You're walking with Dan Gunn up the Rue Jean Dolan. On my right here, the walls of the Santé prison. This was a street frequented by the writer in whom I've spent many years working, Samuel Beckett. As anyone familiar with Beckett's work knows, locomotion and inhibitions on locomotion, constraints of one kind or another, were central to Beckett's work. He himself was a man who enjoyed walking. As a young man, he would roam the hills near Dublin with his father. There's a beautiful letter to his great friend Tom McGreevy from 1933, written shortly after his father died. In it, Beckett recounts the final day in the life of his father before breaking off and saying, I cannot write about him. I can only walk the fields and climb the ditches after him. When he moved to Paris in the late 1930s, the whole city became his stomping ground. Certain letters recount the walks he took from one edge of the city to the other. And these streets in particular became important to him. From early in his work, of course, his characters are walkers. Belacqua, in his first published collection of stories, More Pricks and Kicks, walks with a spavine gait. Murphy, in the novel of that name, roams around the parks and streets of London, as Beckett himself did in the mid-1930s. Estragon, at the beginning of Waiting for Godot, or En Attendant Godot, as it was, given that Beckett wrote it first in French, is struggling with his boots, trying to get them off, which prompts his friend, Vladimir, to exclaim, that's man all over for you, blaming on his boots the faults of his feet. In his later plays, motion is even more severely challenged. In Endgame, the whole world seems constrained to the space of a single room, and the parents are confined to trash cans. In Happy Days, Winnie, the protagonist, is buried up to her weight in a mound, and in the second act, up to her neck. And it can become yet more severe, as in the play called Play, where the three characters are confined to urns, with only their heads protruding. So these are the Beckett streets, and this street in particular became very important to him after he moved flats in 1960 from number 6 Rue des Favorites to 38 Boulevard Saint-Jacques to my left here. When he changes apartments, Beckett hopes to reduce the dichotomy in his life that existed between Paris, which was so much for pleasure, company, friends, relations, but where he found it hard to work, to his cottage in Ussy sur marne to the east of Paris, to which he would retreat in order to write, but where he often found the isolation rather extreme. He takes a walk up to the seventh floor of his new building, the apartment still under construction and the elevator's not yet working, and he looks out of the window of his den, as he calls it, the room where he will be working, and in another letter to Tom McGreevy, he says, perhaps it will be possible to work again in Paris and have a life a little less solitary when we move into the new place. Though the view of the Santé prison from the den I'll have is beginning to upset me in prospect. Two years later, He's still worrying about what he calls this great hulk of the Santé prison. And three years after that, in the final letter of what is our third 
volume of the collection of Beckett's letters that covers the period 19, uh, 1957 to 1965. Indeed, in the final sentence of the final letter of this volume, he writes to Tom McGreevy again and says, through the open window, I hear the Sante prisoners howling like beasts and see beyond the Val de Grasse and Panthéon illuminated. There's no writer more important to Beckett, in my view, than the author of the Divine Comedy, Dante Alighieri. When I hear Beckett looking out of his window in this way, I can't help but imagine him describing a Dantesque topography. Immediately below him, infernal, is the Sante prison, where the prisoners are howling like beasts. As he raises his eyes, perhaps purgatorial, there is the Val de Grasse hospital. And above that still, the place where the great and good of Paris lie buried, the Pantheon. Of course, being Beckett, paradise is only ever ironical. It's not a place which one can know, penetrate, and it remains not a place for him, not a place for us, certainly not for his characters. Beckett learns to watch the prisoners as they communicate with each other using a system of mirrors. Perhaps I can strike a personal note here. In 1974, which is to say 40 years ago, as a teenager in Edinburgh, the town from which I'm, I hail, I was looking through the program to the fringe of the Edinburgh International Theatre Festival. I noticed there that a play was about to be put on by a group of prisoners from the San Quentin prison in California. With my closest friend, we decided to go and see this. What we saw has never left us. We didn't understand a single word of it, of course, but the sounds, the accents, the strangeness has haunted us ever since. As it happens, just the other day, I was working on a letter from 1974 to the star or leading actor of that production. This man was called Rick Clucci and he was on parole from San Quentin Prison. Beckett became a great friend of his and helped him in so many ways, including financially. He encouraged theatres to stage Clucci's productions. And in the final year of Beckett's life, when he was already a very sick man in 1989, he read through Clucci's autobiography, correcting it line by line, correcting Clucci's spelling errors and his grammar. It's perhaps not surprising that Beckett had a sympathy for prisoners. Of course, all his work is dealing with the underdog, with the outsiders, with those who don't fit in, with failures. Famously, he said to Georges Dutuy in his three dialogues that the artist's duty is to fail as no other dare fail. Beckett is that rare writer who appeals both to scholars and to prisoners. He wrote one of his very last plays for Vasclav Havel, then incarcerated. Havel, who then, of course, went on to become the first democratically elected president of Czechoslovakia and subsequently the Czech Republic. That play was called Catastrophe. As we walk along these prison walls, I can perhaps finish by invoking one other prisoner. This was a man who was in the prison of Lutringhausen in Germany, who in 1953, the year that Waiting for Godot was first produced, heard about the play, procures himself a copy somehow, reads it, translates it, and with his fellow prisoners, puts on the play. Beckett is amazed by this, impressed. And to this man, he writes a letter. This letter, or at least an extract of it, I shall recite to you now. It was written in French, but I'm going to recite it in the 
translation by my friend and colleague George Cray. Beckett writes, My dear prisoner, for a long time now, more or less aware of this extraordinary Lutringhausen affair, I've thought of the man who, in his cage, read, translated, put on my play. In all my life as man and writer, nothing like this has ever happened to me. To someone moved as I am, phrases come easily, but from a sloppy way of talking, not at all your style, given that I am no longer the same, and after what you have done, all of you. In the place where I've always found myself, where I shall always find myself, turning round and round, falling over, getting back up again, it is no longer wholly dark nor wholly silent. That you should have brought me such comfort is all that I can offer you as comfort. I, who am what is called free, to come and go, to gorge myself, to make love. I shall not be fatuous enough to dispense words of wisdom to you. To whatever my play may have brought you, I can add this only the huge gift you have made me by accepting it. <laughs>